Lord Meghnath Desai, he is the recipient of the third highest civilian award in India, the Padma Bhushan Award. Um, I welcome Lord Meghnath uh, Jagdish Chandra Desai. Uh, to facilitate the conversation with Lord Desai, I would like to introduce Mr. Alkesh Wadwani. He leads the poverty elevation portfolio for the Gates Foundation's India Country Office, uh, which comprises of um, programmatic work in agriculture, development, water, sanitation and hygiene, financial services for the poor and gender equality. Lovely to have you with us over here. Uh, over to you, Alkesh. Thank you, Pooja. Uh, it's great to have this chat with you, Lord uh, Desai. I'll say a few words about you. Uh, you are very well known, uh, of course, but still, if you don't mind, I'd say a few words. Uh, as Pooja said, you are a well-known economist and a Labour Party politician. Uh, you, you stood for the post of Lord Speaker in the House of Lords. Uh, you have been chairman of the Labour Party from 1986 to 1992. You are a professor emeritus of the LSE and a prolific writer. Uh, it, again, uh, it's great to be with you on this chat. Uh, we've had a very interesting day today with a diverse set of speakers. Uh, one that started with plenary addresses uh, by Professor Abhijit Banerjee and Professor Ar Arvind Panagraya, as you know. Uh, who shared a broad range of viewpoints between them on poverty and growth. Uh, we've had CEOs of multinational talk about the market's role in economies and in spreading prosperity. Uh, we've had the principal scientific advisor talk about R&D and the role of innovation in growth and in uh, uh, reducing poverty. And finally, we've had nonprofits talk about the needs of the grassroots level. So it's a uh, this is really uh, a great time to round it off with you who have who's had a career spanning academic, academics, uh, economics, and of course, writing. Uh, so maybe I'll start with what perhaps is the need of the R, uh, which is the fact that COVID has caused not only a lot of lives, but the fact that it's caused huge demand and supply shocks. And there's no doubt that, that GDP has gone down and perhaps poverty has also increased. Uh, in this scenario, you've, I've, I've read that you've spoken about re reflation, and I'd just like to hear more about what you think needs to be done uh, to reignite growth and to see that poverty doesn't just go up in, exponentially in this period. Okay, uh, let me start. Thank you. Uh, let me start with a factual correction. Everybody who introduces me says, I was chairman of the Labour Party from 1986 to 1992. I was not. Chairman of the Labour Party is only for one year. I was chairman of my local constituency Labour Party. My apologies. No, no, no. Every, they, they, they just read Google. <laughs> <laughs> that's all they do. Uh, you know, Google has made us all very lazy. Uh, but that, uh, no, um, let me say this. Uh, COVID has been a completely unanticipated and unanticipable shock. Unlike what happened in 2008, it did not arise from misbehavior on stock markets, banks making bad investments or governments running, none of those. So in a sense, it is a, it's a pure, what do you call a black swan? A pure black swan, uh, which, is, which is something which has probably surprised us. And what has, what it has done is it has made us realize for the first time that economic life, apart from all the thing about uh, maximizing and all that, economic life is a context sport. You know, uh, although we talk in terms of individual maximizing and firms maximizing, unless people physically get together, the economy can't operate. We never thought about the economy that way. We only thought we were going to buy and selling, demand and supply, investment consumption. But the fact that consumption cannot just be done by me, that's no fun. I want to consume with somebody. I want to buy something from somebody else. And I very often want to buy it in person. The big thing which happened with coronavirus, unlike earthquakes or any of that, the contact became impossible. We had never thought about that. Physical contact impossible. So at that time, what we could do? Well, 
we decided, economists across the world decided, that balanced budgets and deficits and all of them completely irrelevant. The task of an economy was to sustain as much life as possible, regardless of debts or debts or anything like that. So you can borrow as much as you like. In this emergency, it's like an earthquake. In this emergency, you don't wait, you just borrow as much as you like and make quite sure that this flow of contact can be renewed. Now, right. it's, very, it's very difficult. We have having a discussion in the UK, can pubs reopen? You know, how can pubs reopen? Because pubs are close contact. So we have discussed And so it has challenged us. And 25% uh, drop in GDP has never been seen before. Not even during the Great Depression. So suddenly, with the three months, with the four months. So we are learning that economy, and I said, economy is like kabaddi, or, or like rugby. It is not like cricket or tennis. Tennis can be played at a distance. But Kabaddi has to be and so production and consumption in economics has to be a joint activity. And as soon as we can make that possible again, life will come to normal. In the meantime, break all rules. So are you advocating therefore that both on the fiscal side and the monetary side you should be as liberal as possible? It is not it is not just me uh, advocating it. Across the financial and uh, intergovernmental uh, authorities. Right. Everybody has said, IMF has said, you know, the US has practiced it, UK has practiced it. UK, which was very fiscally conservative, has now borrowed money like there's no tomorrow. Right. Why? Because ultimately, you have to save lives, you have to save, uh, you know, you, you have to save jobs, you have to save the economy. Right. It's no good. No good. Just saving money. Yeah. Money is, is a is a means. It's not an end. But even before, even before COVID happened, uh, some of us, were, myself included, were saying, "Don't worry about the debt, the debt GDP ratio. Think of how much it costs to service the debt as a proportion of GDP." Right now, interest rates are very low. Globally, interest rates are very low. Uh, you know, they're, they're negative. In, 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 in real terms, yeah. Yeah. Borrow like there's no tomorrow. And yeah. that, will, that will revive the economy. Right now, it will feed the economy while it can't work. Right. And, and when the economy yeah. can work, we will get the money back. Yeah, yeah. So if you if you adopt a stance of saying this is the time to save the economy and borrow as if there's no tomorrow and don't worry since interest rates are low, where would you advocate that this money be spent? In what kind of activities do you spend it to save farms? Do you spend it to save individuals? Uh, and as many countries have done, say 80% of salaries are protected. And in a country like India, where most jobs are informal, what do you really do? Well, I have been writing about this that basically just as we have Manrega in the rural areas, which says 100 days work guaranteed, one member of the family and so on. What we should have done is for urban informal sector workers, they should have 100 days guaranteed unemployment benefit. Right. Okay. Yeah. Those people didn't have to go from Delhi to Uttar Pradesh. Yeah. And had a cushion of money, let's say for 100 days, or you could extend it to 100 days. To right. Where they are, because yeah. roughly 200 million informal sector workers uh, were, were left destitute. And we have wasted a lot of their time. We have spread uh, coronavirus in rural areas. And in a sense, in what was called a planned economy and all that, there's no preparation for a large chunk of workers who are the most needy. Uh, right. So I would say that we should think. And another thing I would say, and also I have advocated in past, I would like all women, I would, I would like a basic income, but only for women. Right. A universal basic income for all yeah. adult women. Because yeah, women yeah. a lot of unpaid work. Right. 
you know, you know, uh, they they need to unpaid them routinely. We have one of the lowest uh, uh, labor force participation rate of women in all of Asia. Uh, yeah, and there are a lot of women doing work but not getting paid. Do right. those two things, and you would have a solid welfare state. Yeah, yeah. You've, uh, you know, uh, the government has done something like that on the women's side by uh, having some money paid to SSG women every month. So I think to, to some extent that's happened. So what you're talking about is the immediate need. Uh, how do you see it on a slightly longer term basis uh, in terms of what you've written maybe 10, 15 years back about the need for India to say that the only way to address poverty is to get people out of rural areas into agriculture, into manufacturing oh, and to cities. Absolutely. So how, how do you see that today? Maybe you've said this 15 years back. I still, see, I still see that as a major failure of Indian economic policy. That right. we didn't create enough jobs in organized industrial sector, the formal sector, uh, to absorb all the rural surplus labor. So the rural surplus labor is in rural areas, in the subsistence farmers and all that. 58% live in rural areas which is a disgrace, I think. And then these urban workers who came out uh, during the corona, whom we certainly believe became visible, they are the other victims of our bad industrialization policy. So I said, let us basically construct a welfare state. You know, just as I was saying, the generalizing the Manrega idea that every worker uh, who is temporary, you know, not, not in a proper job, will get some sort of uh, unemployment benefit. Uh, 100 days a, 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 a year would be one, one day, maybe 200 days. But they can't get it if they are in work. Right. And then we'll have to devise ways in which there are incentives to work rather than the rely on yeah. unemployment benefit. So if we do that, it will create a very solid producing power uh, in the economy. But also, it will almost your the the, the core of poverty in India, uh, which is going on. For, see, for example, if we had decent housing for these people, you know, you know, they would not have had to migrate. Now we have huge infrastructure projects, and and you know, people build uh, luxury apartments in Gurgaon and, and Noida. In Delhi itself, these people had no decent housing. So why haven't we thought about that? For example, with with uh, with three D printing, you can you can you can build a house very very quickly. Some countries have done that. So we ought to think big about a core welfare state. Right. So let's say the elements, as you've described, of a core welfare state are that. Uh, you know, you protect the urban poor, just like you have Narega and you have maybe great rental markets, uh, low cost rental markets in urban areas, again, to provide some sort of a, a floor for uh, urban workers to, and even to attract them. Uh, but even beyond that, I think your point often I've read has been that uh, the state should have, a, you should have a minimalistic state beyond this, and it's more about markets creating uh, jobs and prosperity. So how do we compete there? If you look at even today, uh, COVID has caused huge changes in sub, uh, global supply chains, but perhaps most of the changes are being captured by Vietnam and other countries. So what does India need to do these, to capture these uh, global supply chain uh, uh, advanced, uh, shifts? Yeah. You know, two things have happened across the world. There's all the debate about market or the state. Sorry? All right. There's a debate about market or the state. Right. Now, COVID has said only the market, uh, only, only the state can cope. But everywhere the state has failed. Across right. the world, the state has had to do this. And across the world, the state has failed. Very interesting. But uh, uh, answer to your question is, you know, historically, Vietnam or Korea or Japan or Taiwan, what they did, they took their businessmen in confidence with the government. The government said, you guys are good, you take risks, you, you, you export, we will help you to export more. In India, what happened from the beginning, although the business community was nationalistic, they supported the Congress and all that, as soon as became independent, private business was treated with suspicion. 
no, 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 you can't do that. Only the government can do industry. And if you go, and that has not gone away. That has not gone away for all these years. Rao, Rao Singh government of 1991 opened up the economy. But even now, for example, when Narendra Modi became prime minister, Rahul Gandhi said, ye to suit boot ki hai. And he got, you know, he got, he got, he got sort of a, a shocked by that. And so the business government cooperation doesn't exist in India. Now that is a synergy, you know, because India has been a successful business economy for 3000 years. I mean, and then the private business has been there forever in Indian history. Export has been there. Uh, financial markets have been there. Let us not stop them. Let, and so I think that there's a mindset in the politicians of all parties needed in which they listen, boys and girls, business create jobs, business create growth. Government doesn't create growth. Government may collect money and give money, but government by and large is not efficient enough. To, to, to. And for example, had we not nationalized our banks way back in 1969, banks would not be in such a pathetic uh, situation as they are. Banks have become part of the, the crony capitalism because they are politicized. Uh, you know, we had the most unhealthy banking sector, uh, you know, for, for a country which should be growing. So I think we need a, we need a mental uh, change. And that has to come within politics, by politicians. And it is not, you know, it is not a divisive issue. It's not about secularism and Hinduism. It, it is basically, let us grow like other countries have grown, take advantage of our private sector, because there's a lot of energy in the private sector. Right. Uh, for example, we never think of farmers as private sector. It's a private sector. Sure. Surely the Green Revolution was powered by farmers taking incentives on and responding. Yeah. We should do the same with, with industrial business and, uh, and service sector. Uh, you know, in addition to, I'm just a bit scared, my headset is uh, saying that it's on low power. So if I lose you for a minute, please excuse me, I'll go to the speaker. Uh, you know, uh, the, the percentage of uh, different sectors now where the government is involved beyond banking is not very high. I mean, most sectors have been opened up, uh, including other financial sectors like non-banking financial sectors, insurance. Uh, of course, manufacturing services is pure 90, I'm sure, bulk private. So in a way, the the business has moved to the private sector, right? So you talk about the mindset, mind shift change, uh, but you also see some moves by government, like the government talks a lot and has tried to do a lot on ease of doing business and they've got their scores up. So beyond the mindset change, are there specific policies, are there specific um, bottlenecks that you think are stopping businesses from growing? You see, basically, we have still got a labor law, you know, in which some laws are been there for before independence. Right. Now, when when the textile manufacturing, you know, there used to be a constraint on, a, you know, it was a, a multilateral fabric agreement. When that was removed, countries like Bangladesh, started having textile mills with a thousand workers. And right. India, you can't have a thousand worker factor. But it's, so we have an actual, you say we have a lot of private sector to do business, but they are, there was somebody told me 127 inspections per year uh, for a factory. If you want to start a restaurant in Mumbai, you'll have 80 licenses. We haven't, we haven't, uh, we haven't released the private sector at all. I you, yeah. and, and our non-banking financial sector is a mess because when Ireland FC uh, collapsed, collapsed, yeah, you know, we have uh, we have the banking sector credit uh, uh, really in a in a in a crunch because of non-performing assets. We have non-banking sector. We have a judiciary which always delays settlement of financial cases, things like that. I mean, we really do need to say, if you're going to have a vibrant economy, you've got to get seriously all these obstacles out of the way. Trust the right. private sector. Don't have all these uh, 
a bureau of this and bureau of that in checking on, on everybody. Right. And uh, despite the IBC that this government did with a good idea in uh, insolvency and bankruptcy court, we still are not would that would, uh, would work because, uh, you know, the, the, the law tribunal has been uh, a sort of a crippled by yeah. judicial delays. So we have this thing that we have to work, make it balance. Yeah. Sorry, my headphone has a problem. I'm just going to change. So give me a minute. I'm sorry, Pooja, in case you need to come in for a minute, that's fine. Don't worry. Yeah. I'm... Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you perfectly. Well. Okay, fine. I'll just continue that. Uh, so it seems what you're saying is that we still have a lot of shackles in the private sector, whether it's labor laws or just the plethora of rules and regulations. The shackles are in our minds. Right. You know, unlike Japan or South Korea, at independence, we made the mistake of thinking that capitalism was imperialism. It right. was of Western invention. And we had to stop, we had to be like Russia. And that, that crippled us for 40 years. Uh, and even when Rao and uh, even, even the BJP is very suspicious of the business sector. They certainly start talking about, you know, Swavalamban or this or that, you know. You know, get your businessmen to cooperate with the government, trust them to go and do good for the country because if they make money, it will be good for the country. Yeah. That, that is that's a psychological belief which no Indian political party has. Yeah. Very yeah. And maybe they, yeah. Politicians may have. But, and so, you know, so, so Koreans, there's a story that Koreans came uh, uh, on the UN's advice to look at India and Pakistan's uh, planning commission in late 1950s. And they decided this is what we're not going to do. <laughs> and they were poorer than us at that time. And their income now is 25 times, per capita 25 times our income. Yeah. And this yeah. is a serious, serious issue. And in India, it's very hard to convince people. They say, no, no, you can't really let the private sector do this, you know. They will steal, they'll rob, they'll do this, you know. So other people steal and rob, not, not the private sector. And I don't right. think that, that, that is possible. I think what the COVID, shown, COVID has shown is that the surplus labor, the surplus underemployed labor is paying the cost of our slow growth. Right, and, and yeah. That mentality. Yeah. We want yeah. More. yeah. So moving from you know what it what it, what it takes to get the private sector going and then and then change in mindset that's really required. Uh, I want to come to another topic, which is your view on poverty, which is that it's multi-dimensional and it's not just about a poverty line. Uh, would you like to say a bit more about that and where do you think government should play a bigger role in multi-dimensional poverty? or a smaller role and markets should take over, yeah. whichever way you think of it. Again, again, historically, we never put money into health and education. You know, we, our poverty was only how many calories people can consume and how much those calories cost. It was all very foodie. The whole right. poverty debate was very foodie yeah. uh, originally. And you know, 15 rupees is whatever it is. And we didn't like to say, I mean, we, we do sort of partially here and there, like when when um, in Bihar, Nitish Kumar started encouraging women, girls to go to a school, give yeah. a bicycle, uh, yeah. private, uh, so things like that are immensely powerful in reducing poverty or, or, or health and education. You know? So health and education, unless you give that, and I'm sure when you started today, uh, Abhijit Banerjee would have told you that, that, you know, Poverty is a multi-dimensional thing. And because it is not about eating today. It is about yeah. how you're going to chart your future. You have to give not only people food for today, but something they will do something better tomorrow. And sure. that is health and education. The capability, yeah. as Amartya Sen has said, the capabilities people have, have to be developed. And right. for that, you have to have, not just giving them money, but giving them facilities to be able to do things which will give them the ability to have a better tomorrow. Right, yeah, yeah. I, I think that there is some good news. I'm not saying that there's enough spend, being spent on health, 
uh, but the fact that the government over the last couple of years has started the insurance scheme for uh, for the poor and also started to uh, yeah. I think, uh, uh, in, in, in his first term Narendra Modi did a lot on health right and, and his Aishman stuff is very good I mean, yeah, I, I find Bharat is very good, and I think you know. But here again and again, you know, the, the problem is that things get diluted. I mean, the amazing thing, in my view, done in Modi one, has been sort of delayed or diluted. Uh, something, something has happened and it has not kept up that pace. And right. I think we need to finish that. Uh, we need to finish that welfare state, uh, health, education. Uh, and uh, and sort of nutrition, right? Or for example, we have too many farmers. You know, two thirds of our farmers are subsistence farmers. Get them out and give them industrial jobs. Rural industrialization would be very good. We need rural industrialization, and that that would be that would really relieve uh, our rural areas of surplus labor. I know you can't hear me, but. <laughs> Don't worry. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. You, you're absolutely clear. So I think it's probably oh, good. You know, so, 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 you know, I think uh, uh, rural industrialization, as I would say, is another need which, which, uh, which blends with what I'm saying about surplus labor, because our farmers, two thirds of farmers are subsistence farmers with holdings of less than an acre. And, you know, it's not viable. We got to get them out of farming, not be not be not be so sentimental about this, the song and all that. You know, I mean, we just we just get on with it. Uh, allowing them to stay in farming is harmful to them. Yeah, that's why you need debt cancellation. Yeah. You know, if I am an ordinary worker in uh, in in an urban area, they won't forgive my debt. But if I'm a farmer, they'll forgive my debt. And where is the justice in that? Right. You know, yeah. uh, so I think we have to think unsentimentally and think in terms of uh, not categories, sort of mental categories. Basically, yeah. how tomorrow the children and the children's children are going to be better off. We have right. wasted too much time over the last 74 years. We've got to get on with it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, uh, you know, some changes that maybe the markets have taken care to some extent in the sense that. More than half the income, even in rural India, is non-farm income by now. Uh, so you know, I think, it, yeah. But that is compulsory. Yeah. Because from their land, they cannot get enough income to be able to sustain themselves. Right. So you know, I mean, I I read the Labar report of a, a while ago, which we shows that. But let them have better jobs off the farm, sure. within the, where they live. Rural yeah. industrialization. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to now again change topics, which is we've got a few questions from the audience. So I'm just going to read some of them out to get your thoughts on them. Uh, so the one, uh, one, uh, one of the questions is, says that India has a problem of too many welfare schemes poorly implemented. If you were to prioritize which welfare programs would you get the government machinery to run behind? You know, I think one of the great difficulties is politically, to take away benefits people have, yeah. you know, especially because our benefits are caste based. Our whole affirmative program, because of Mandal, has gone so completely meshed in with the social structure and the backwardness of the social structure. Caste has been valorized by Mandal. So if I if I construct a welfare, you know, Mohan Bhagwat has said this, and, and, and he got attacked for this. Mohan Bhagwat, Hero Parishad, said, you know, before the last Bihar election, why can't we get rid of all this, all this, you know, task based allocation? And people say, ah, you see, he wants to deprive the Dalits of what they gain. And the BJP, I think we'll have to do it gently. We will have to do it while not abolishing, but letting the existing caste-based things erode slowly. But right. the original thing is that I say informal sector workers in urban areas, workers in the rural areas, and women. Yeah. You know, those are three priority uh, sort of groups. 
Right. Then I would say construct a welfare state around them. And of course, you know, uh, children's schooling and so on. But, and be ruthless about that. Uh, you know, we're too much hung up about government jobs and, and uh, admissions to universities and so on. That is, that is kind of middle class uh, kind of uh, concerns. And while, you know, you need affirmative action, we have, to, we have done enough of that. We really need to pay attention to what COVID exposed, the huge weakness of uh, the economy, the urban informal sector is basically helpless, left, yeah. left kind of, you know, supportless. And I think the sight of those people walking on, 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 on public road, it was, it, was, it was very indicting of where we had gone wrong. Yeah, yeah. The next question is, uh, and I think you've uh, partly answered it, most Indians work at bare minimum wages, which isn't enough to lead a fulfilled life. If we don't create enough good jobs in time, we are looking at an entire generation of youth that may go underemployed. How does India go from here to create good formal jobs with social security? Uh, yeah. Now, you know, basically, uh, again and again, when we create jobs, we put on developed country side conditions, you know, permanence, you know, social security and so on. Let's create jobs. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, so... I mean, I would say when we come back from COVID, when those informal sector people come back, let's employ part of them all the time to house construction. Sorry, to what? You know, massive house construction for them. Right, yeah. In urban areas. So yeah. next time they don't have to go back. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's something like that. What, with a lot of service labor, we can, we can, uh, we can have the house construction done. Yeah. And, uh, you know, something like Dhara is a scandal. You know, people have romanticized Dhara, you know, but Dhara is a complete scandal and the COVID has shown what a scandal Dhara is. And unless, you know, how can Mumbai be a, get a great city, you know, and all that, uh, while Dhara exists. So we got to, first of all, get rid of Dhara and improve things over there so yeah. that we can have decent, healthy housing conditions. I've lived in Mumbai. You know, and, and so I, even in well-built houses in, in, in Charles, in, in Bombay, health can be terrible, the toilets are terrible, and, things like right. that, and the disease spreading. We have to take seriously uh, those, those, those health conditions. Yeah, yeah. You know, despite, I also live in Bombay, despite uh, the, the housing challenges in Dharavi in terms of maybe sanitation, uh, the houses, by and large, by there are pakka, and uh, the amount of manufacturing and industry that's there is pretty amazing. Oh no, no, that's all true. But see, what really happens is that there are health hazards. Yeah, you know there yeah. are health hazards, and it's a low-lying land. Well, yeah. I've, you know, I've, I've been there. There's low-lying land. Yeah, and it, it is marshy land, and when it rains in in uh, in Mumbai, despite the biggest, the richest uh, municipal corporation. It floods every month. Sure. Yeah. The right. last question. Yeah. The last question that I have uh, from the pa from the participants is: uh, On the one hand, we say labor laws in India are restrictive and don't allow businesses to go. However, we also have a situation where workers don't have sufficient social security, while governments are looking to suspend labor laws in favor of growth. Will we have to compromise social security for growth? Is there an alternative path? So as you know, in, in this last few months, many states have relaxed the labor laws. No, the thing is that we have a lot of labor laws and security for people employed in the formal sector. Right? I mean, that's right. the basic thing. Formal industrial sector and sure. the government sector. Yeah. There is a lot of, you know, if, if you people, you know, PhDs apply for class four government jobs, because once you then you can't be sacked. You know, I mean, there's no other job security like a government job security. So, you know, basically, uh, there's an island of secure jobs created. And that island is politically very powerful and is preventing that condition from spreading elsewhere. Uh, I know this, this is, it is really remarkable that we always hear about what about security. What about healthy income growth of the industrial worker and many of them year after year. Uh, so for 
fairly a small uh, proportion of people. We have kept a lot of other people in insecure and underemployed jobs. That is not being seen. People see socialism as protecting public sector jobs or, or formal sector jobs. Even I argue with trade unionists in India that if they let these labor laws go, there'll be more union members. Union right. membership would be fantastically larger. They would become more powerful. But our manufacturing sector has been stuck at a small proportion of total GDP. You know, a service sector is the largest. Why? Because government doesn't regulate service sector. Yeah. Why yeah. is our IT sector large? Because the planning commission never thought it was important. So they never right. regulated it. So it grew. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we are running out of time. So I think I'll uh, close and just uh, try to summarize your thoughts, which... Uh, My which thought is... is uh, go ahead. You know, let India become an Asian country. Yeah. <laughs> yes, the look, Asian... Look at Asia, yeah. look at Asia, learn yeah. from Asia. Asia has a lot to teach us. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Learn so just... Asia and prosper. Right. Yeah. So it, you know, I, I, one of the few speakers I've interacted with who has a clear sense on both what the government needs to do to create a welfare state uh, from having uh, the rural poor have some social security, maybe Narega, as you said, to having the urban sector also get 100 days work and finally women. Uh, but couple that with freeing the, the energies of the private sector, changing mindsets so that the private sector can grow. And one way to do to do that and to unshackle that is really to see that yeah. they are not shackled through labor laws and other means and yeah. rules. And if we can do that, India can bloom. I think that's yeah. what I'm learning from you. I think denationalize the political system. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Lord Desai. It's been Thank a you. great pleasure talking to you. Okay. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye. Okay. So thanks a lot for yeah. Happy thanks a lot. Of August. Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> thanks care. a lot. Thanks a lot, Lord yeah. Desai, and thanks Alkesh for joining us for the Nudge Forum. Uh, very interesting takeaways from this session as well. Uh, one of the biggest takeaways for me uh, was that we wasted 74 years, and I think we should get on with work right now. And the second, exactly. yeah, and the second one is uh, how do we learn to become an Asian country? Uh, okay. Yeah, so thank, thanks a lot, Thank sir, you. for joining us. Thank you very much. You're very welcome.